I think it's incredibly important for application developers to understand the infra. I think there's some potential future world where all of the infra is actually perfect and you can have these like mental abstractions. None of the blockchains are there. None of the blockchains are even close to there. Solana is definitely not there yet. And I think it's really important for application developers to understand how the chain works so you can build better applications that serve the users better. This episode is brought to you by Access Protocol. Access Protocol is the best way to get access to premium crypto content without the ads, without the annoying subscriptions that are impossible to cancel. It's crypto native. It's here today. Go check them out. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we're joined by Eugene from Ellipsis Labs. Eugene, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Fun to have you on. Eugene, I'm not going to lie. I think you are one of the smartest people in the Solana ecosystem. So I'm pumped to have you on. And there's a, there's a lot we could talk about. But the thing that I really want to focus on, at least at the beginning of this podcast, is your post that you put out about two weeks ago. Uh, you tweeted it. And the title was, Solana local fee markets are not real. So I want to get to that because it's a bit controversial. And I think a good place to start would just be describing how transactions work on Solana. So like as I, as a user, go to Jupyter, what happens between the time when I click submit a transaction and when it actually comes back on the UI and it says confirmed? For sure, we can start there. Uh, honestly, Mert might be a better person to, to answer this question than, than, than me. So uh, feel free to, to jump in any time. But as I understand it, um, Jupyter creates a transaction that goes to your Phantom wallet to get signed. Uh, when the user hits approve transaction, that goes off to Phantom's RPC. In theory, it could be any RPC, which uh, forwards the transaction onto, um, onto a validator, which then forwards the transaction to the leader. So the leader is whoever is currently elected in the proof of stake system to build the current block. And then there's a bunch of complexity inside the, the validator itself, inside the leader itself, um, but essentially, there's first this uh, network layer, the quick layer that transactions go through, and there's some throttling that happens there. So if your transaction gets dropped, this is one place where it can get dropped. Um, after it makes it through there, it goes into the scheduler, or uh, internally it's called the, the banking stage. But think of this as like the, the block builder, the thing that takes transactions, uh, orders them into a block, executes them, and uh, then forwards them on to... To, to the rest of the network. And so the transaction gets queued for execution. And there's a lot of complexity here because the queuing is, um, is multi-threaded. And so there's another source of jitter here. Um, and essentially, you have multiple threads that are executing these transactions as they come in, scheduling and executing. And the transaction can get blocked if it is trying to access some state that another executing thread is currently using. So Solana has state access lists, which uh, built into the transactions themselves. So at the time of transaction creation, the transaction specifies exactly which pieces of state it needs to read from and which pieces of state it needs to write from. And this allows for this parallel execution. It also allows for parallel fee markets, uh, but those aren't really quite implemented yet in Solana. Yeah, that was really helpful. So I have a few questions uh, for me, but also the audience. So one, um, you said it's multi-threaded, which essentially means you can do like parallelization, correct? From what I understand, there's like four threads and how you can think about it, at least easier for me, is thinking about like lanes, like lanes of traffic and you have four lanes, right? And that's like four threads. One question I just have at a high level is why is it four threads? Like computers have multiple CPUs. Why is it limited to four? Yeah, how did that number get picked? Uh, that's probably a better question for Solana Labs, but I think my mental model for how a lot of the constants on Solana work today is someone just, some engineer, like roughly arbitrarily picked it a couple of years ago and just these numbers haven't really been revisited. They seem to, they've worked okay up, up until today. Um, if you wanted to have far more threads, um, there's, there's some trade-offs you'll have to take into account. One, you might have a little bit more contention uh, for these for these accounts that are getting locked, um, so that you have a little bit more overhead managing this this locking system, which is uh, you know single threaded because you have like a single like uh, locks manager, uh, and then you might also impose a higher requirement on the validators themselves, so higher hardware requirement where instead of having uh, you know needing four cores for execution, you might need uh, more more cores there, 
And it's like, so, so there's four threads for, let's call them user transactions. And there's also two separate threads for vote transactions, which are uh, regular transactions in, in Solana. Uh, so technically there's six threads, but uh, yeah, uh, for regular user transactions, there's four. To maybe talk a bit more about how those numbers are picked, they are kind of arbitrary, right? Like basically there's 48 million compute units available and that was picked because it was determined that that's kind of how much um, uh, uh, the machine can process to arrive at 400 millisecond block times. Um, and so it's it's more like an empirical uh, uh, way of getting the number instead of like doing some complex math to arrive at the right number, which we can talk about why Solana does that versus Ethereum maybe, which is on the other side of the spectrum there. So you're talking about one block has 48 million compute units. Um, an account can have up to 12 million compute units in that block. And that is what really is supposed to allow for local fee markets. And an example that people often use of this is if you have an NFT mint, that's not going to raise up the prices uh, across the board for, say, another DeFi transaction. Um, and that's something that would happen in Ethereum. You are saying, though, that that type of local fee markets doesn't really exist yet. What what is the reason for that? Like, what is preventing those lo local fee markets from actually working today? Sure. So, they kind of work. They work in this probabilistic sense. And first, we have to get to this difference in block building between Solana and Ethereum. So, on Ethereum, you have these uh, blocks that are at a very high level comprised of these user transactions that have gone to the mempool. And then you can imagine the most naive, greedy block building algorithm is you sort the transactions in the mempool by gas. And then if there's uh, too many transactions in there to fill up a block, then you just take the, the highest paying transactions. So you can imagine for 11.9 seconds of the block, these transactions are entering the mempool and in the last uh, 100 milliseconds, the block is built in this greedy way by the block builder. On Solana, it works quite differently where the blocks are actually built continuously. So as transactions are coming in, before the 400 milliseconds of the slot are up, the leader is building and executing the block on the fly. And so there's a lot of places where you don't get these guarantees. So for example, on Ethereum, if I send in a transaction at the very end of the block that has a very, very high uh, gas price set, I'm very likely to get into the block if the block builder is being greedy. And this is not necessarily the case on Solana. So for example, if the block has already reached its 48 million CUs, and then I try to uh, add something to the end of the block that uh, pays a ton to the validator, I'm still not going to get in because the block is already built, and I'm just going to make it into the, into the next block instead. So you have this continuous block building, which means you lose some of the guarantees from discrete block building. Um, I think there's just a ton of benefits you get from continuous block building where you can get really fast pre-confirmations to the users that are not limited by the by the block time itself. I think that's one common misconception people have about Solana where they think the fast pre-confirmations come from short block times. And the short block times do help because you get to confirm and finalization a little bit quicker. But it's really the fact that you have continuous block building. So in theory, you can have a pre-confirmation that is as fast as uh, one round trip between the client and the and the leader. Uh, then when it comes to local fee marks, we have to go a little bit more into the implementation of the block builder. And just real quick, none of this is actually enshrined in consensus in the same way that an Ethereum uh, block builder or Ethereum validator can propose any valid block. There is no like rule of consensus that says the blocks must contain the uh, the highest paying transactions. That's just uh, an incentive that the that the block builder or the validator has. And this is also true on Solana. So as these transactions are coming in, they're getting queued and there's a single priority fee that can be set on the transaction. And you can roughly imagine the way these blocks are getting built. So we have these like queues, uh, pretend there's like four queues for the four uh, lanes of traffic, the four executing threads. And transactions uh, get scheduled to get executed, and then sometimes they get blocked and they, they can't get executed and they go back into the queue. So one way that you can implement this queuing mechanism with the priority fee is sorting the queues by priority fee. Uh, here you would have like a, a priority queue of transactions that's, that's keyed by the, 
the priority fee set. And so if you set a higher priority fee, you are more likely to get in. Um, but it is still possible that if I send a transaction at the same time as you that is accessing the same accounts and I set a higher priority fee, you might still get in first because you might end up going into uh, a better lane just by uh, you know pure chance. Uh, and it's also possible that even if my transaction is seen first, at the time mine is going to get executed, it's blocked by this locking mechanism and then it has to get requeued. And then maybe yours is coming in right after that. And by that time, the lock has been cleared. And so yours can go in first. The canonical example is you have some hot NFT mint happening, right? You have a hot NFT mint happening. And the behavior you want is if there's way more than 12 million CUs per block of demand to access that state, the price you need to get in, the priority fee you need to get in is going to be higher than for some other uncontested state. And this is true uh, in some probabilistic sense, because you're more likely to get blocked trying to access this high contention state. Um, but you still have this like global block limit. And then there's no real notion of a market, right? These things are all in this, I don't want to call it an auction, but it's kind of like a first price greedy mechanism. Uh, and the user, when they're sending the transaction, they have no idea um, what priority fee to set to, to get in. And this is really not an issue when blocks are not contested, right? So, or yeah, when the blocks are not full. And so this is sort of the regime that Solana has, the market regime that Solana has been in for uh, more than a year, probably probably two years or so, where blocks are just like generally not full. And then with the recent spike in activity in the last couple of months, we've seen blocks that are full. We've seen um, uh, accounts getting saturated in by the per block 12 million CU limit. And... Now we see some of the, the downsides of this priority mechanism where because you have this first price mechanism, uh, it's very difficult to know upfront when you're sending the transaction, what is the priority fee I need to set to get in? And there's a lot of inefficiencies here where you have this incentive to, to spam because of the jitter, and then you might be overpaying in terms of your priority to get in. What you really want to enable, and this is like what most users actually want, right? Especially when the fees are somewhere between like one one hundredth of a cent and maybe a few cents or even like 10 cents, the user really just wants to say like, hey, get my transaction in as fast as possible uh, and just like pay whatever the market gas is. And there's no mechanism for that uh, on Solana today. Whereas with some sort of controller mechanism that will tell you in consensus, in protocol, hey, here's the what we think the fee you need to set to get in is. In fact, it might be like minimum fee enforced by consensus that says, uh, if you don't pay at least this much, you're definitely not going to get in. And then uh, that number can modulate depending on what the demand is. Uh, that actually provides for a significantly better user experience. So today on Solana, when the blocks are full, we're seeing all the natural things you would expect to see from this first price mechanism where all these protocols and all these users and all these bots are seeing, oh, my transactions are not getting in. The users are unhappy. And so everyone is just like jacking up the priority fees kind of indiscriminately um, in this like highly uncoordinated way, very empirical way. And that leads to a lot of inefficiency in the system. Yeah. And in Ethereum, we've seen EIP 1559, right? Which is that like inconsensus um, base fee that will go up as you have more, as the block's more saturated over time. And then, you know, it's more predictable to get the next transaction in. I actually, over the last few weeks when, you know, Solana and just the ecosystem was kind of skyrocketing with attention. Uh, my Jupiter transactions were getting dropped. Is that, and I, I don't know if that was related to slippage or are blocks at this point actually getting full enough where we're already having this problem where the fees are moving fast? Did they show up on your wallet? No. The failed transactions? If, uh, if, that's a good question. Maybe some of them. I just know so I had a, to... There, there's a bunch of ways your Jupiter transaction will fail to get in. So I think what Murd is getting at is if you see a failed transaction land, uh, that probably means your slippage was not set high enough. Uh, so like the market moved uh, away from your trade before you were able to get into the block, but your transaction was still scheduled and executed and landed on the blockchain. And there's two main other ways your transaction is not going to get in. And these are just like very difficult to observe from the outside. You don't really know where your transaction failed. One of them could be at the priority fee level, uh, where because the block is contested, or the, the, the account you're trying to touch is contested uh, and your priority fee was too low, you were never able to get in. So that means your transaction made it to the block builder, it made it to the scheduler, but it was never scheduled and included for execution because, um, 
because you were just like never at the, the top of the queue. And then another way your transaction can fail to get in is getting throttled at the network layer, at the quick layer. And it's just impossible to tell from the outside which of those is happening. That makes sense. I guess at a high level, what are the basic ways to, to fix some of this going forward for Solana? Yeah, so the network layer, I believe, is the actual layer where most of the transactions are getting dropped today. This is from my conversations with like RPC providers and some of the Solana core team. Uh, and that I have very little visibility into. I wouldn't say I have any good ideas on how to how to address that. That's like this very general like rate limiting problem, uh, which is you know pretty tough. There is some like economic incentives you can you can throw in there, but at the end of the day, that really is uh, more of a more of an engineering problem. And then on the scheduler layer itself and the the fee mechanism itself, setting a floor price on the priority fee I think will just like help a ton. And so there's a lot of ways you can do this. I think. In my mind, there's three changes we can make that are pretty much purely additive. Like, there's just not that much downside uh, in terms of just like really helping us improve the the user experience on Solana, really getting back to the fast inclusion and fast confirmation that users love. Uh, so first is on the on the base fee. Uh, when all the blocks are full, like in the last few days, just like all the blocks are. Not all, but like the, the vast majority of the blocks are full or very close to full. This suggests that the base fee itself is too low. And here you just need some sort of escalator mechanism on the base fee itself. Today it's set to constant 5,000 LAM ports per signature. Um, let's call it three hundredths of a cent per transaction. Uh, and this is just like much lower than the market clearing price today. And so you have this first price behavior with the priority fee, which again is this like probabilistic thing. Uh, so one easy thing we can do here is, oh, if you see many of the last, many of the recent blocks are full, you jack up the base fee until the blocks are no longer full. So you have some sort of target utilization as well as max utilization. This actually looks very, very similar to, uh, EIP 1559. Um, but we don't even need to think of it as like related to what Ethereum has done. It's just like a basic controller mechanism where you have some, uh, you know, you have a limited resource, and when there's too much demand for the resource at the current price to uh, include everybody, what you need to do is increase the price until you hit the market clearing price. Uh, the second thing we need to do is instead of making the fee paid, the base fee paid constant per transaction or constant per signature, it really ought to depend on the amount of compute that the transaction uses. So today, a Solana transaction can use up to 1.4 million compute units. And if you use 1.4 million compute units, your base fee is exactly the same as a transaction that only uses 10,000 compute units, even though the larger transaction is more expensive to the network, uh, consumes more of the resources. So the base fee just really needs to have some component that is linear in the number of CUs used or compute units requested. I think that's pretty much a, a no-brainer as well. And then the more controversial piece is how do we actually price these write locks? How do we actually price the, the contested state? And here, I think, you know, again, we can just implement a pretty simple controller mechanism where uh, you have like a, instead of having like a global base fee or just a global base fee and a global priority fee, you have a global base fee. So this is the controller that is going to make sure that when the blocks are all full, we're going to jack up that fee. And then when the uh, usage goes down, then we can lower the fee again. You also have a mechanism like that on each account. So if the Phoenix sole USDC market is hitting its 12 million CU cap very, very frequently, we should just increase the price that's required to access this market with a similar controller mechanism. And there's a lot of details here, right, that we're hand waving away. Like, what is the shape of the controller mechanism? How do you communicate these uh, price changes back to the users or back to the, the developers. Um, but those are all like pretty tractable problems. They're more engineering problems. Uh, figuring out like what is the right controller mechanism? Uh, how fast do you want to increase the prices? Maybe that actually depends on what type of account it is and what you expect the shape of the demand to look like. Um, but these things are all really to improve the UX uh, where we have this this uh, constraining resource, right? It's uh, block space is not unlimited, even though on Solana it's like kind of felt like it's unlimited for a long time. In this current market, we see okay, it's not actually infinite. And 
the way you're able to include the most valuable transactions as determined by the users who are sending them is to increase the price uh, and then decrease the price when your resources are no longer uh, overutilized. So there's a lot of uh, theory in controller design. Um, But at a very high level, you just want to have some sort of mechanism in place where if the demand exceeds the supply, you increase the price. It's really not too complicated. Yeah, well put. There's a lot of um, economic back pressure work that needs to go live. Um, Another issue that I might add is that, um, and this is being fixed with 1.17, or at least an attempt at a fix, is that the compute units aren't actually estimated that accurately, right? It's kind of an arbitrary unit, what compute unit means. Um, and, and so that's something to keep in mind. Um, Just and then on to- that, Merck, can you explain, like, why does that matter? Like, how does that actually function? So, like, when a transaction is submitted, it, ha- it has estimated compute units, correct? And if that's way off from what's actually used, why is that important? Um, well, it's just like you're just misappropriating uh, resources in, in a sense, right? Like it's a compute unit is just a resource. Um, and if, if you don't estimate it properly, then you're not making the best possible use of the resources. That's just the simplest way to think about it, in my view. Um, and uh, so, okay, so I, I want to recap what Eugene said, and then maybe I'll tackle the first, very, very first part, which was um, most of the dropping of... Uh, um, transactions let's say happens at the network layer which is to say that like the so basically what happens is you have a transaction and then it keeps being forwarded and then after some time the block hash that you have is invalid and because it expires and and so as a result you don't you just don't make it in um pretty sure what's now going to happen is labs has a new thing for capping unstaked connections so public connections um, which is to say that you, you'll actually you'll need uh, an RPC with staked connections uh, to actually make your or prioritize your transaction properly or extend it. Because previously, I think that mechanism was buggy, such that the the number of public connections that you have wasn't being throttled properly, and so the people with staked connections were getting were not making it in as much as they should be. And so that that's being fixed. Um, but so that's actually like the the quick stuff that went live. Right? It's just not perfectly implemented right now, which is which is often the case. And so that's number one. Uh, and then, so Eugene, just to recap what you said, one is dynamic base fees, in a sense. Um, and then uh, two is going to be, or the last thing you said was basically like adding some sort of economic consideration for adding write locks to, to an account, right? Because you, that's actually kind of like a vector right now uh, that I'm not sure many people talk about. Um, and then, um, the second thing you said was. Is having the base fee depend on CUs used or CUs. Oh, yes. Not. Yes. Because right now it's priced on signatures, which is a very, very naive way, let's say of doing it, uh, or optimistic because they should be a bit more granular in, in, in how you price them. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so the, the existing fee model basically assumes this world where blocks are Te- blocks tend to not be full. And so maybe you don't really need to incentivize lower CU usage, but now we're in a, a market regime where that's not the case and um, a little bit more like deliberate pricing is, is important. Did you see the scheduler fixes coming in 1.18 by any chance? I haven't looked at them in, in detail. I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done on the scheduler and it sounds like there's good people working on it. So that will at least reduce the amount of jitter in the scheduler. The example I was talking about before, where like if we both send the same transaction, uh, it's unclear who's going to get in first, even if uh, one of us is paying a a higher priority fee. And so that should be good for reducing spam for sure. Because right now, if you're trying to get included early, there's this massive incentive to, to, to spam. One thing I'd add on the transactions and the spam is, Eugene, you quoted in that article that at least as of January 2023, I think it's 53% of transactions that land in a block are failed transactions. And is that just because there's spam is essentially dominating the block space right now? Yes. And so, again, this is from January 2023. This is a number that uh, was pulled by the Jito team um, when they were looking at what is actually happening on chain and why are there so many failed transactions. And yeah, most of them are 
spammed arbitrage transactions and spammed uh, liquidation transactions. And because the fees are so low, it's actually a good strategy to spam from the arbitrager's perspective where you want to get in really, really fast. And so the best way to do that is just send your transaction many times. And even if you send your transaction 100 times and one of them succeeds, 99 of them land and fail and you still pay the fee for those 99, it's still profitable in expectation. Um, but of course, it's like kind of uh, a poor use of the block space. And what we would like to see is something where uh, in, in the ideal world, you would have like one of these transactions land and it pays uh, a pretty high amount. And then you don't waste like 99% of the, the block space on these failed transactions. What the searcher is trying to express is like, I'm willing to pay, say, like up to a dollar to land this transaction that is worth $1.50 to me. And instead, the only thing they're allowed to do or the way they express this preference is by sending 100 transactions that are worth one cent apiece. Yeah. Yeah. And the priority fees are supposed to fix that, right? But because of the jitter, because the schedule are not being optimized, it doesn't always matter right now because latency is still such a big deal. Um, yes. Well, it's going to be a feature of a system that has continuous block building, where like getting in first is super important. It's more going to be more important than your pricing. Uh, the alternative approach here is uh, sort of what Jito has done, which is moving more from this continuous block building world to a discrete block building world. My my last question on this whole um, fee topic is just what do you think about, I've seen Anatoly talk about this a bit, and how do you come up with the right base fee that doesn't push out certain types of transactions because you have DeFi competing against payments, competing against different industries. And the thing is, if you push up the base fee too high, it might get rid of spam, but it could also push out these other use cases. So I'm just curious how you think about that. Because like from a, like a lizard brain level, when I think of, oh, there's local fee markets, there's 48 million compute units, and there's four threads. Well, if you have four accounts, getting, you know, like fired at the same time, then those local fee markets go away. And then you're going to have these, you know, low, these payment transactions be priced out. So what do you think about that? So that's more of a global fee problem than a local fee problem. Uh, and at the end of the day, it really is just going to depend on how much economic incentive is there for these payment transactions versus for these other transactions that I think we're implicitly valuing as, as, um, you know, not as valuable as the other transactions to the network. I would push back on that assumption a little bit where, you know, if people are willing to pay for these 48 million CUs and they're willing to pay, you know, some astronomical amount, the network should be including those and not including, uh, you know, a transaction where the sender has expressed a much lower propensity to pay. Otherwise, you end up taking on these pretty opinionated assumptions about the value of transactions and, uh it's like kind of unclear how, how you can do that in a, in a neutral way. Um, and at the end of the day, again, you still have this like finite supply of block space. And if the market clearing price is very high, like the whole point of increasing the fee is to price out some uh, like the lower value transactions. And today it looks like those lower value transactions are going to be these like failed arbitrage transactions that really no one wants them. No one wants them to land. Um, they just happen to land. Uh, uh, and, and they happen to get sent as a byproduct of this like inefficient fee mechanism and inefficient scheduler. Um, but at the end of the day, if there's like so much um, demand for the block space at a at a given price, uh, you're going to end up in this world where if you keep the base fee low, you're just going to have these payment transactions not get in, or they get in with like some probability that's like pretty low. And I think that's just a significantly worse UX than, you know, hey, uh, when things are really congested, yeah, you have to pay like five cents to get your transaction in. You have to pay 10 cents to get your transaction in. You can wait um, and hope that the price goes down later. Um, but I think that's a significantly better UX than what we have today, which is you're bidding this arbitrary priority fee. You don't really know what it means. You don't really know how to set it. And in fact, it has no like actual economic meaning. It's really an implementation detail of how the scheduler works today. One thing I'll, I'll say before moving on, um, Garrett, is like the four threads thing. Again, just want to highlight that that's arbitrary. I think the design goal here is essentially get the software in such a state that all you need to do to improve performance is add more cores, right? That, and, and that's a long way uh, or, or a long path to get there. Obviously, Eugene's pointing out some very valid um, implementation details and maybe even some uh, actual strategy details as well that are that need to be reworked. But like once those, let's say, hypothetically get solved, 
then if you're in a state where you can just keep adding more cores, that's kind of like what Tolly's and and um, vision is. Quick break to tell you about Access Protocol, the easiest and best way to stay up to date on what's happening in crypto by following your favorite publishers. And you can do all of it without a subscription, without having to worry about ads. And we all know subscriptions. How many do you have? 10, 20? Can you cancel it? It's all a mess. Well, Access Protocol solves this and they do it in a crypto native way. They have over 60 publishers that include CoinGecko, The Block, Crypto Slate, and a whole long list of independent creators. So how it works is you find your favorite publishers and you stake the ACS token. That's the Access token. And once you stake, you have access to all that creator's content about the hassle of ads or subscriptions that you can't cancel and you don't know how many you have. Access Protocol already has over 225,000 users that are finding new creators, that are reading content, and even receiving NFTs from these creators because one of the cool things with Access Protocol is that these publishers, they can know who their subscribers are. They can make it where, okay, maybe we'll do an in-person event or maybe we'll do an NFT drop and we'll do it only to our most loyal stakers, aka readers. In early 2024, they're even releasing V2. It's crypto native, it's on Solana, and it's an awesome product. I've got a link in the show notes to the hub. Uh, it's the easy way to get started so go check them out today quick break to tell you about an upcoming event i promise you don't want to miss it's blockworks biggest and best institutional conference called das london it's a two-day event happy in london this march we're going to have over 700 institutions 130 speakers and a couple thousand of us all under one roof crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions and they're showing up we have companies from blackrock to visa launching real products in the space we have the real world asset narrative taking off we have things like payments that have been exponentially growing and then we have things like deep end happening in the solana ecosystem there's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space is going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 10% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 10 when checking out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the show. You briefly mentioned Searchers, and then Quick we also briefly about- described Jito and how they kind of get around this idea of continuous block propagation by holding like these mini discrete auctions um, or, or blocks. Can you, okay, so let's, let's for people, because we, we haven't actually covered MEV on the show before. Um, so for our listeners who aren't going to be sophisticated traders, um, could you briefly describe what MEV is? how it differs on Solana um, from Ethereum and um, just how it works in general. Like explain like I'm five. I can try to explain it to you like you're 20. Uh, So MEV at a very high level refers to how much value uh, and the types of value that can be extracted by whoever has this monopoly power of organizing the block. So that's the leader for both uh, the leader of the block for both Ethereum and Solana. So you can run this default native block building algorithm, which on Ethereum would be you order all of the the transactions in the mempool by gas, and then sort yeah, order in descending order, and then place them into the block until your block is full, and that roughly will like maximize the value for the uh, for the for the validator. And on Solana, the way the native block builder works is uh, via the scheduler mechanism that we've talked about. But you can imagine if you have some like uh, infinitely intelligent, infinite computational power uh, validator, there's a lot of other ways they can they can make money as well. For example, you see all of these trades that are, are made. Uh, some of them are like very profitable trades and the validator could be inserting them themselves at the top of the block. There's this arbitrage opportunity, they're going to take it. And so today, the way these are extracted is not actually by the validators themselves, or very rarely by the validators themselves. It's by these external entities called searchers who are searching for these MEV opportunities, these profitable trades, and then trying to land them on chain uh, before the opportunity goes away. So Ethereum has this notion of independent block builders and independent searchers as well, although uh, there is some searcher builder integration. And so instead of the leader having to run the block building algorithm on their own and like make modifications to that on their own, that's delegated out to these third parties. And so on Ethereum, there's like three to five dominant block building entities that like 90, 95% of the network delegates the block building responsibility to through the system called MEV Boost. That's totally out of protocol. On Solana, these searchers are just like sending transactions to the network uh, 
Uh, on blocks that are not run by Judo validators, they're just sent the normal way. And then the only way you can try to get your transaction prioritized, as a searcher, you might really care about, uh, for example, landing this profitable arbitrage before anyone else can get to it. So you want to be really fast, and you might want to bid a little bit higher on your priority fee to, to, to get included. But there's no explicit mechanism for, hey, I'm willing to pay up to a dollar to get my profitable transaction in and don't include my failed transactions if I don't get there first. And the reason a mechanism like this would be good is, one, you reduce the amount of spam that lands on chain. So that's like this sort of wasted block space. I think most of us can agree. Even the people who are sending the failed transactions would agree they would prefer all else equal that these transactions do not land on chain. You just want the successful ones to land on chain. And then it also prevents this vector of validator centralization. Now, I think it's highly unclear how important this really is. On Solana today, it's actually very unimportant, in my opinion, because the inflationary awards to validators are significantly higher than the amount of MEV that's available. And uh, the, the worry here, though, is you have the centralizing force where the, the most sophisticated validators can extract more value. They'll be able to attract more stake because they can re- offer higher staking rewards. And so in theory, you have this economic pressure that centralizes the validator set via staking incentives. Um, but that incentive is quite small on Solana today. And I think uh, far more important to Solana is reducing the amount of spam that lands on chain. So the way Jito does is they just implement this auction mechanism where they say instead of uh, whoever is fastest makes it on first, they have these 200 millisecond discrete auctions that are happening during the Jito slots, which today is about 40% of all of the slots. And... There you have, uh, they, they call it a, a tipping mechanism where you basically uh, send a tip to the, to the validator to include you first, and then your failed uh, tip. So if you lost the auction, your transaction does not make it on chain. And when you talk about that, it gets into value accrual, or at least how some people would talk about it, right? Because right now, um, maybe as a searcher or someone that wants to get their transaction on chain and arbitrager, they use latency as the main means to express their preference. Whereas this hopefully moves some of that to actually you pay to play, essentially. And that payment can go to the validator who then goes to the stakers. And in Ethereum land, they often say that MEV is like the value accrual of ETH. Um, so that is something that could move towards Solana in some ways, or at least you know help with validators being profitable. Have you had any thought on just how applications can accrue any of that value themselves? All of the tips for this hot state goes to the validators and to the stakers, but not to the individual apps themselves. Do you think there's anything that we can do there or that you've seen? Yeah, so there are definitely things that can be done here. I would say they're generally quite opinionated. And the main opinion that is going to get expressed here is on the sovereignty of the block space. So who owns the block space that is contested and who, who receives the, the, the economic benefits of owning this contested block space? So you can imagine some mechanism where we've implemented these uh, dynamic fees per account. And then instead of the fee going to the validator or going to the network, it goes to the application. You might create some perverse incentives here where now instead of trying to minimize MEV, uh, which is not always, but often ends up being uh, negative to the users of the network or the user of the application. Uh, now you might want to be maximizing it. Um, but any any proposal like this is going to be really, really opinionated on the specific question of who owns the block space and who deserves the the economic proceeds that come from uh, controlling this, this limited resource. Uh, I think like, in general, applications, there's a lot of work applications can do to reduce the amount of MEV that they expose. Uh, for example, Ave and Compound came out with this um, you know, pool-based lending mechanism uh, where you have external liquidators come in and uh, before the position goes underwater for the protocol, you give them some incentive to unwind the trade on behalf of the user to prevent the, uh, the protocol from, from losing money from, from bad debt. And... Uh, the initial mechanism that they, that they use was sort of giving this flat fee to the liquidator, something like 5% or 2% of the, the notional value of the loan. And right at the point where the loan goes underwater. So you end up with this very like spiky MEV opportunity where 
there's no MEV, no MEV, no MEV. And then all of a sudden, when the price crosses some threshold, now there's this like discrete change in the amount of value that's extractable. Then we saw Euler Finance come around with their lending protocol, which is actually very similar to Aave, except they have a dynamic uh, fee associated with the liquidations. And this means like the more underwater a position is, the more incentive you give the liquidators. But that incentive starts very, very small. So now you're really, one, you're rewarding skill, where instead of uh, anyone with half a brain being able to execute this liquidation opportunity and then it becoming who is willing to, uh, who's going to be fastest or who's going to be able to to pay the most. Uh, And remember, this value is not going back to the protocol. This value is going to the liquidators or uh, in the end state actually going to the validators. You can actually internalize a lot of that by hosting this thing that looks like a reverse Dutch auction where... As the position goes more and more underwater, the bounty for the liquidation goes up, but it starts very, very small. And this, in general, should reduce the the liquidation bonuses that are paid. And you end up in a in a regime where the the uh, the validators or the network receives a lot less of this value, and more of it is kept to the by the protocol itself. And so there's a bunch of you know application specific things that application developers can do to reduce the amount of leakage to MEV. I think this really hasn't been studied very much on the Solana side uh, because the MEV marketplaces are just uh, much less mature and the total amount of MEV is just a lot lower. Uh, But we should expect some of this to to change. Um, It also depends on the users caring about this, right? Like usually if a a user has like a loan that is going underwater, it would have been really beneficial for them to just unwind it themselves rather than paying this liquidation bonus um, to the network or, or to the liquidator. And in practice, we see like, yeah, users are just like not particularly sensitive to this type of thing, even if they are economically harmed by it. Yeah, so I have two two follow-up questions here. Um, wh- one is going to be just, you just mentioned the users here, and uh, I, I have seen some funny tweets uh, recently. Um, I, the, so this guy, HGE, posted that uh, every time you swap on Solana, you are getting attacked by bots stealing money from you. Uh, and, uh, there, there is, you know, it is shitcoin coin season. And basically what ends up happening is you, you launch token, the bots snipe it, the liquidity, and then the prices get a little weird for the users. Let's say, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, how, how should, um, what would you like to see more from the ecosystem so that we're more, more sure about that stuff going forward? So I don't know if I'd agree with that exact wording, but I would say like, yeah, there are opportunistic bots that profit immensely from this shitcoin activity. There's a couple main ways in which they do it. Uh, let's throw out the, the sniping for now and just focus on the user transactions themselves. So I'm some user, I go to Jupiter, I see there's a, you know, a price for this, this shitcoin I want to buy, and then I go click trade. There's a few ways I can get wrecked here. Uh, or lose out on some economic opportunity or get like a worse fill. The first is sandwich attacks, which roughly means uh, I set my slippage to 10%. What I was really trying to say is just, I want to market buy this thing. I just want to pay the fair market price at the time my transaction gets included. And then the, the only way I can express that is by setting a high slippage tolerance. So if the market moved like 2% away, I'm still going to get in, but I'm just going to get a 2% worse price. Um, and what a sandwich attack does is if they see your transaction and they're able to land a transaction in front of it, as well as a transaction behind it, they can actually force you to get this, the worst price that you set. So even if the market price is 2% worse than what you, than what you saw in Jupiter and you set your slippage to 10%, the bot is going to push the price to the point where you actually get this worst fill possible. You get this, um, 10% worst fill and they're going to make this profit on top of that. So that's pretty toxic to the to the users themselves. Um, previously, we did not see this on Solana for two reasons. One of them is just, again, the bounty was not high enough for people to set this up. And two, because Solana has no mempool, you can't see these transactions or only the validator themselves can see it. So if the validator wanted to do the sandwiching, they could have done it. They, they could have done it this whole time. Uh, now there's like some notion of mempool exposure through, uh, through Jito. So... Um, there's a lot of this like probabilistic sandwiching that we're seeing on chain today, which is basically forcing users to get worse fills than they would otherwise. 
And then the other way in which the user can get wrecked is through back running. Uh, usually this is more an artifact of poor routing or you know, the routing being set at the time you send the transaction. And then there's some delay between then and when your transaction gets in and may no longer be the optimal route. And so after your transaction lands, let's say there's like three pools for the same shit coin, but your transaction is specified a single pool. After you make this trade, the back running bots, the arbitrage bots will come in. They will sort of equalize the prices among all the different pools that have the shit coin. They'll make some profit from that. And in theory, that should be that that could have gone to the user in form of better execution on the trade or they could have executed across all the pools at exactly the right amounts to keep those prices in line while taking on the position they want to take. Well put. Um, okay. So the second question I'm going to ask, and this is just a tweet I'm going to read, is from Tolly, And he says, and I want to see if you agree or disagree with this. My theory on MEV is that all the efforts to correct it will, resu will result in worse information latency. So a discrete batch auction of 10 seconds will end up with a worse price than the average price of 100 millisecond blocks. But the MEV will be unevenly distributed in the latter. Uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with this. And I think this goes to like a fundamental uh, philosophical difference between the Ethereum world and the Solana world, where the Ethereum world has been so focused, uh, or the MEV side of Ethereum has been so focused on um, democratizing the opportunity, as they say, uh, which is sort of equivalent to maximizing how much the users get screwed and then making sure that that profit from screwing the users is distributed as, as evenly as possible in a way that doesn't affect the validator incentives or it doesn't create validator centralization. And that also, so, you know, th th there's a few problems with that one you... Uh, clearly make the user experience a lot worse. Uh, it's also bad for the applications because they just continuously like leak value away from their system to the to, to the base layer. Um, and if you optimize for speed, like with continuous bl block building versus discrete block building, yeah, you are going to have these returns really accrue to whoever is going to be able to be the fastest. Um, but the user transactions will get in more quickly. Uh, and as long as there aren't too many other negative externalities, like again, today we see so much spam landing on chain, which is a negative externality. And if we worry a little bit less about, you know, this theoretical validated decentralization or, or centralization of stake to, to, to the highest performing validators, I think a lot less of an issue. And even on the Ethereum side, where, you know, we've been pretty worried about this theoretical validated decentralization, I think that was probably just a lot worse in the, in the proof of work world where a mining pool with slightly better unit economics actually can just like mine a lot more. And in the proof of stake world, we've seen like the stake is not actually that sensitive to the APY. Uh, certainly like if, if my validator is getting 4% and yours is getting like 4.1%, we haven't seen things like massive amounts of stake moving from my validator to, to your validator. But it is possible maybe in the long run that that does happen. Uh, we just don't really see too much evidence of it today. And we see even like, like Coinbase staking has more than ten percent of the, um, more than ten percent of the Ethereum stake today, and they're charging like a twenty five percent commission on all the staking rewards. Like clearly, the people who are delegating there are not delegating because they think Coinbase is going to give them the best APY. There's something else that they're optimizing for too, which could be uh, really trusting who you're delegating to. There could be like legal and compliance reasons. It is possible to focus too much on the dem democratization and then um, uh, neglect other parts of the system because of it. Okay, so completely shifting topics here. Um, I, I did want to. I didn't want to finish this episode without bringing this up at least once. I want to talk about risk, right? Um, so the other, I guess, month at this point, um, there was an incident with the MSOL um, price really taking a pretty big dive, and then. Solant came out and said, "Well, actually, we use the the, the native asset for the uh, the native asset oracle." And then some people were like, "Wait, what? Um, what did you think about that? And what do you think about the way we've managed risk in Solana DeFi so far in general?" I think protocols that are hard coding asset prices are taking on a particular type of downside risk that might not be getting communicated to the users. It's kind of the same as hard coding USDC to one or USDT to one, or um, you know, some, yeah, some, some stake derivative to uh, whatever 
the protocol thinks is the fair value, uh, rather than really focusing on protocol solvency and uh, using the market prices to, to dictate that. So there's definitely some downsides of the latter approach, which is what we see more on the uh, Ethereum world, where um, you know you do create potentially an incentive to uh, attack the markets, to manipulate the markets, to create liquidations. Um, but then you end up with this, like, if you're hard coding, say, like, mSol equals, you know, 1.1 sol or whatever, in the case where mSol gets exploited uh, and the actual fair value of mSol goes to zero, your whole protocol basically gets gets drained. Or you, you know, you get drained to some degree and then maybe you have some other uh, ways to, you know, pause the protocol. But at the end of the day, like, you're, you're probably still screwed. Um I think the risk discourse is pretty healthy. I wish it was a little bit more um, uh, constructive rather than so antagonistic because there's a lot of real questions there that I think deserve a a better discussion. And also, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, leveraged protocols are derivatives of protocols that we see on Ethereum. And most of the Ethereum protocols have sort of taken the, the same stance around like we're just going to use the oracle price we're going to use the market price and it's not obvious that this is what you should be doing all of the time um but at least the the discourse that we've seen in public has been very very far from constructive that makes sense you know you're an application builder but you know a whole lot about mev and how these transactions work on solana so you work at phoenix um but you also write research at umbra or umbra is that the right way to say it that's right umbra umbra i want to get into what you're doing over there. But one thing that I hear about application developers on Solana is you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You just worry about your app because everything scales. But you even write research about how Solana works and how these fee markets, et cetera. So you're like, you're getting really deep into it. Is that just out of interest or is that because it's so important to something like Phoenix that you're working on? I think it's incredibly important for application developers to understand the infra. I think there's some potential future world where all of the infra is actually perfect and you can have these like, mental abstractions uh, where you don't need to actually dive any deeper into the infra. None of the blockchains are there. None of the blockchains are even close to there. Solana is definitely not there yet. And I think it's really important for yeah application developers to understand how the chain works so you can build better applications that serve the users better. Uh, and so, you know, I myself come more from the, the Ethereum world uh, before we started the company and went uh, full-time in, into Solana about one and a half years ago. And what we saw here was, you know, a very refreshing focus on pragmatic engineering on the Solana side and a little bit less interest in some of the incentives and, you know, very, very high level uh, economic design that that is so prevalent in Ethereum. And over this last year, I spent a lot of time uh, you know, continuing to talk with people on the Ethereum side, many of whom have been, you know, interested in Solana because Solana has some very, very different approaches than Ethereum has taken to some similar problems. And it's just impossible for them to understand how Solana works, uh, even at a high level. So the top goal for Umber Research is first and foremost to explain how Solana works in a way such that other motivated researchers who have no understanding, no background knowledge of how Solana works can come in if they're interested and be able to meaningfully contribute to Solana. Uh, So I think a lot of this reference material has been uh, super valuable in terms of onboarding Ethereum researchers onto the Solana side. Um, And then with, you know, sharing some of these approaches, I think... uh, both Solana and Ethereum and all of the other blockchain ecosystems can can learn together. And, you know, I think on the Solana side, we've been able to bring in some of the, the better ideas from the Ethereum world and, and vice versa. And we see, uh, you know, just like a lot more uh, collaboration between, between the two blockchains today. Yeah, I think it's really important. You hear John Charbonneau talk about that as well. And the reason why you chose Ethereum is really like the documentation and the research. It was so interesting. And also you could you could grasp what's going on. I know sometimes in Solana, it's like, where was that post? It was in some Discord, right? And it's like extremely hard to find. So I think it's really important. I'm curious, you know, we've seen the price of Sol go up 
um, exponentially almost over the last year. Have you seen the interest in developers and kind of conversation around how Solana is working? You know, what changes need to be made? Have you also seen that exponentially change over the last year? Or is that a little bit slower than the price movement itself? Uh, I think it's a little bit slower. It's definitely trailing the price, um, but it's it, it's there for sure. Uh, it is kind of funny, like the technology has suddenly become like five times more interesting to, to everybody on like the, the venture side, the investing side and, and the research side. But the attention is definitely good. And there is, uh, yeah, there's like a ton of work to do on Solana. And the more like competent, well-meaning people who are trying to contribute there, the better it is for, for Solana as a whole. Definitely. Um, before we close, I want you to talk about Ellipsis Labs a little bit and what you're working on with Phoenix. Um, maybe describe what Phoenix is. And also, is that, the, is that the only project you're working on? Is that the only thing you're planning to do in the future? Yeah, so at a high level, the, the mission for Ellipsis Labs is to build better DeFi products, to build the backbone of a financial system that is decentralized and gives users all the benefits of decentralization uh, while delivering superior products as well. Um, and so when we started the company, we saw this gap in the market where Serum had existed for quite a while. Serum is like this OG limit order book implementation on Solana. I would say it was probably the first product on Solana that we could really categorize as only possible on Solana, where the fees and the block times make it possible for active liquidity to participate on chain, fully on chain. Um, and it was just a project that had been kind of neglected for a while. It was under the Alameda FTX um, um, consortium. And there just wasn't very much love put into it. Uh, we identified a bunch of architectural changes as well as product changes to uh, you know, build a new limit order book from scratch that takes all the learnings we've had on Solana over the last three, four years and just uh, you know, builds a much more modern version of it. Um, and one thing we see with a lot of the other liquidity primitives on chain is they are just like not sustainable or they have this very fundamental trade off between quality of liquidity and sustainability because, yeah, these uh, X, Y equals K or other AMM type designs suffer from having the liquidity profiles being so constrained. Whereas with active liquidity, where you let these professional market makers really just place the liquidity where they want to and foster this competition between liquidity providers to provide better prices to users. Uh, that's worked very well in TradFi. And uh, we see it as like a step function improvement over what exists in DeFi today. And that really is only possible on high throughput, low fee blockchains like Solana. So uh, the product is called Phoenix. Uh, the protocol is called Phoenix. Today, we're around the number, somewhere in the top 10 uh, DEXs by trading volume. Um, across all blockchains. And awesome. the most important thing that we care about is the liquidity being uh, profitable and the liquidity being unincentivized. So we don't offer anything like, hey, retail, come put your money in here and you're going to get 100% APY uh, with a bunch of asterisks on top. Uh, the liquidity is primarily provided by professional liquidity providers who care very much about being profitable and sustainable, uh, which is super important for building a lasting financial ecosystem. Yeah, so when you say that, does that mean you wouldn't offer liquidity on meme coins likely just because of the giant volatility or are there market makers out there actually supporting that? So uh, there are some meme coins where market makers profitably provide. In fact, like it's probably far more profitable for them to provide on those meme coins than on uh, a coin like Sol USDC just because the, the spreads are so much wider. That reflects the volatility. Um, but I think the biggest trade-off between this active liquidity model and a passive liquidity model is like there is a lot of upfront work that goes in for a single market maker to be able to uh, participate. And so if the volume on a particular, you know, meme coin or whatever is just not going to be, uh, not going to make it worth it for them, then then the AMM pool is going to outcompete because you can have these retail guys come in and just like one click deposit liquidity. And uh, I think there is a lot of value in that as well. 
Yeah. I'm not saying this is good for the liquidity providers, but is it also maybe true to say um, with AMMs and heavy TVL protocols that that liquidity is probably stickier? And so that if you did have a big market disruption, for example, and someone needed to mass sell, like this person that mass sold and sold the other day, um, that liquidity might still be there um, for someone to actually exit. Whereas I'm assuming maybe on something like um, Phoenix, those market makers might just pull out. Yes. uh, But in practice, actually, what happens is these AMs are making these very, very unprofitable trades during those times on behalf of the liquidity mm. providers. Yeah. So, like yeah, the, so the LTs get, get screwed. Done exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. One thing you mentioned is uh, you're not offering like 100% APYs to retail investors or uh, L- I shouldn't say investors here, LPs. Um, you, all, you also don't have points at the moment. And you've had um, a few fun statements out there about points. You're seeing point systems throughout Solana. Um, yeah. What do you think about points? So I think incentives in general can be very powerful bootstrapping mechanisms, whether it's like points or tokens or something else. Uh, But again, like we have this core product thesis that active liquidity can outcompete passive liquidity. And the only way that we are able to, you know, be confident in this thesis is by not having incentives. So we've seen with many of these other um, DEXs, whether they're AMMs or order books that offer very, very heavy incentives, you don't actually know if you have product market fit. And so like the whole point of incentives is to usually to bootstrap these um, two-sided markets, right? Where the uh, the liquidity supply and the liquidity demand need to be there at the same time. And the way you do that is via these incentives to cross this activation energy threshold. And then slowly you need to wean off the incentives. And uh, for many of these DeFi protocols that, you know, focus a lot on incentives, um, They've, they've, they've noticed like, oh, as you try to wean off the incentives or as your token goes down because you're providing so much incentive in, forms of this, in the form of the token, the liquidity also goes away. The usage goes away. And so you don't actually know if you have product market fit until you remove the incentives. And some of these um, DeFi teams, um, you know, spend seven, eight, nine figures in incentives without even knowing the product market fit. So I think that's like not a really good way to to spend money and also not a good way to validate the the product thesis. But I think um, in general, incentives are a very powerful tool. Yeah. Just need to be used appropriately. (laughs) Well put. Um, Two final questions. One is just at a high level, and this is probably hard to answer. How do you see Solana? Do you see it as a consumer chain, a DeFi chain, an NFT chain, or do you think it support all those things? And then the question after that to close us off, is just any advice you'd have for a Solana builder or someone looking to come build on Solana? Sure. So I view Solana as a general purpose blockchain. Uh, it's unclear if a single blockchain will capture all of the use cases. It's possible that different architectures uh, will make sense for different types of applications. Um, and it's also not clear how much benefit there is to everything being on the same state machine. So it seems pretty clear to me that, uh, you know, it's going to be important for all of DeFi or a big portion of DeFi to be on the same chain. So you have composability between lending protocols and, and trading protocols and, uh, and, you know, these like staking derivatives and whatnot. Uh, it's not as obvious that that all needs to happen in the same place as uh, NFTs or uh, gaming or whatever other applications might come to the blockchain in the future. Um, so I think the answer to that question really just depends on what is the demand for composability as well as how good the cross-chain infrastructure can get. Uh, haven't seen too many great designs on the cross-chain side. Uh, there's a lot of the roll-up teams on Ethereum working on these these types of problems, but yeah, nothing really seems too promising in that direction right now. And then... In terms of advice to other Solana developers, I think the most important thing is to ask questions. Uh, Solana really, from the outside, looks like this pretty insular community on the developer side. Um, But what we found is that people are actually very, very open to answering questions, um, talking about the pieces that are like less documented in the system. This goes, uh, you know, across every layer of the stack. So, you know, the Solana core team is, is... is really good at engaging with with uh, application developers. The the RPC teams who understand the infrastructure very well are also really great about engaging with developers. And we've also had a lot of good results just talking with other application teams. Um, 
So yeah, I think like, you know, just being willing to, to reach out is really important. Understand that a lot of pieces of the system are, yeah, just like not documented super well. Solana is still a work in progress. And uh, the answers are out there, but you might be able to get answers faster by talking to people rather than by uh, reading the code. Yeah. Yeah. Very good advice. Yeah. I think the interoperability is going to be a huge question mark for the next year. I think fees on Solana is going to be really big and just how it handles, you know, scale. Obviously, what is really enjoy about Solana is it's, it's already focused on this. Um, and that's like one of its sole focus. And I do think as the SVM gets extended, hopefully there's more experiments that you might see similar to like L2s can experiment maybe with certain fee markets that Ethereum can't. Um, so he's made. Eugene, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, everybody go check out Ellipsis, check out Phoenix. Um, thanks for coming on, man. Like I said, you really are, uh, I think, one of the brightest people in the space. And Solana is super lucky to have you. Thanks for having me, Garrett. All right, I've got a little ending note here. First, thank you so much for listening to the full episode. If you really liked it, hit subscribe. But secondly, make sure you sign up for DAS. This is BlockWorks' biggest institutional conference happening in London in March. I've included a link in the show notes and also a discount code. You get 10% off. Make sure to use Lightspeed10 when you sign up. All right, I'll see you there. And I'll see you next time on Lightspeed. <laughs>